The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Irregular border crossings can end in terrible tragedy, as Canada and the United States witnessed last week. Will new rules just agreed to and put into effect better manage the longest undefended border in the world and the migrants who try to cross it? We'll assess that tonight. Then, he once counseled prime ministers and CEOs as one of this country's leading global business ambassadors. Thomas D'Aquino is here on his memoir, Private Power, Public Purpose. It's Monday, April 3rd, and that's ahead on The Agenda. When U.S. President Joe Biden visited Canada recently, one of the signature announcements centered on new rules around irregular border crossings, such as what's been transpiring at Roxham Road at the Quebec-New York border. With us now on the wider implications of amending what's known as the Safe Third Country Agreement, we're joined from the nation's capital by Laura Matacoro, associate professor at Carleton University, specializing in the history of migration, Aaron Woodrick, director of the Macdonald Laurier Institute's domestic policy program. And here in our studio, in from D.C., the other capital city, Christopher Sands, director of the Canada Institute at the nonpartisan American policy forum, the Wilson Center. Christopher, great to have you back here. It's nice to be here. In our provincial capital and to Laura and Era and points beyond our nation's capital. Thank you for joining us as well. Let's set this up with a bit of a fact file. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up and away we go. These are the changes that uh, our Prime Minister and their President just announced. Uh, changes to the Safe Third Country Agreement coming into effect March 25th. The agreement was amended to apply across the entire Canada-U.S. border, and that means asylum seekers apprehended at so-called unofficial ports of entry, such as Roxham Road between Quebec and New York, as we indicated, they can be sent back in both directions now. Refugees can also be expelled from either country if caught by officials within 14 days of crossing the border. The changes are an attempt to manage the flow of asylum seekers between the two countries. Nearly 40,000 asylum seekers came into Canada at unofficial points of entry in the year 2022. However, Canada has agreed to accept 15,000 migrants from the Western Hemisphere through official ports over the next year. Okay, that's the background. What do these new changes, Christopher, in your view, mean for Canada-U.S. relations? I think they're very positive. One of the arguments that we've made about Canada and the United States is the border is better when you have a good partner on the other side that you can work with. And that's the contrast between the Canadian border and the Mexican border. This deal was initially negotiated last year. It's been going through the boring process of uh, interagency clearance in the U.S. and the president's visit moved that forward so we could get to a deal faster and I think it'll take some pressure off both governments. Laura, let me get you to speak to what you think is driving refugee migration from the U.S. to Canada. I think there are a couple of factors. One is the issue is larger than just Canada and the United States. Migrants are coming from around the world seeking opportunities either for refuge or economic opportunity. And so the whole question of global pressures is part of this equation, as is the nature of refugee determination processes in both the United States and Canada. And we've seen different press pressures on the systems in each country. And let me do a quick follow-up with you. Are both sides, officials on both sides of the border, is everybody clear on how the returns, quote unquote, are going to work? That's a good question. I think the agreement was announced, or the additional protocol was announced very quickly. And so both migrants and officials have had to, uh, to, to respond, if you will. And so there has, you know, there are questions about has there been adequate training? Um, what does happen to people if they are detected at an unofficial border crossing in terms of the communications that are provided? We know that one of the exemptions to the Safe Third Country Agreement is if you have a Canadian relative in in Canada, so someone who's a permanent resident, an immediate family member, uh, and yet there are stories of people having been returned despite having Canadian relatives. So there are some questions about just how the clarity of this agreement, which is a very complicated agreement, and the processes by which people are returned, and then what happens to them after they're either returned to Canada or the United States. Aaron, let me get your take on some of the 
domestic Canadian politics at play here, because this agreement to amend the Safe Third Country Agreement was signed by both countries last spring. The Canadian government, I gather, downplayed the possibility of border rules being changed for months and delayed the announcement in order to avoid an influx of migrants at the border. In your judgment, was this a reasonable position to take? Yeah, look, it's, on the one hand, it's encouraging that this has been in the works for a while. I think a lot of people have been asking questions why, with all the political pressures building up and the stories coming out about the numbers coming across at Roxham Road in particular, um, that there was an action on this sooner, and it turns out there was. And the justification for holding off was they wanted to make sure all the, the T's were crossed and I's were dotted before they announced it, because, of course, if you announce something is coming, but you haven't actually, it's not enforced yet, you might have seen, for example, a big rush for people to sort of slip through before the deadline. So uh, in in retrospect, it makes sense that if they hadn't ironed out how it was going to work, that they were waiting until they actually had the deal ready to go that day before they made the announcement. Chris, a ton of people have obviously weighed in on this since this mm -hmm. happened, and I guess there's, I don't know if this is the conventional wisdom, but you certainly hear that some people think the U.S. got the short end of the stick on this and that President Biden's willingness to amend this was sort of, you know, an olive wreath of friendship to Canada in this case. Does that make sense to you? Um, to some extent, certainly the president going up, he's very, he gets along very well with Justin Trudeau. He wanted to do an agreement that would take some pressure off his friend, and that makes perfect sense. But I would put it in a slightly larger context. According to the UN uh, High Commissioner on Refugees, we are expecting in 2023, 117.2 million stateless and displaced persons. They're coming from Ukraine, they're coming from Syria, they're coming from Venezuela, and quite a number of other countries. That's historic. We've never seen that many people who are looking for a place to land. And Canada and the United States are two of the most welcoming countries for new migrants. It isn't always easy, but we have been very generous in letting people in. So we expect the pressure is going to get worse. And so it was really important to get ahead of that to the extent we could and try to put in a, a system of rules. For me, the most important thing is we're discouraging people from taking risks with their lives to go through really hazardous territory and encouraging them to go through channels. I think that will be good for both countries in, in the long run. But most importantly, it's safer for those people trying to find a place to land. So as long, Aaron, as we're talking perspective here, 117 plus million states or displaced people in the world and I know some people get very concerned about 40,000 that are coming over at that Quebec New York border crossing unofficial border crossing if the word of the day is perspective how do you think we should be reacting to that yeah, you know, look, it's no question Canada, by just luck of geography, doesn't face the pressures that, for example, the United States faces on its southern uh, border or that Europe faces in terms of the accessibility to our country. Um, I think in a lot of cases, you know, Canadians see news from the United States and from Europe and sort of don't have an appreciation for the difference in, in the scale. Uh, but that said, I, I think the principle remains the same, as I think a lot of people believe that in a democracy, you know, the, the, the people who are here get to set the terms for who we're going to let in and what the process for for that is. And so I think Rocks and Roll was more a question of, okay, you know, we can have a debate about what our obligations are and how many people we should be taking, but there has to be rules for this. And in a way, you know, the people who uh, want to go around those rules, you know, they're not just, uh, they're not just going against the will of what Canadians want. They're actually skipping the line and impacting other refugees who are following the correct process. So I think you're right. Uh, you know, we're not talking about a scale that, that Europe and the United States is failing, but the principle of following rules uh, is the same. No, fair enough. And, and Laura, let me follow up with you on that. Again, some of the feedback we've heard since this announcement was made is that refugee advocates are very concerned about these changes to the safe third party, third country rather, agreement. How do you think these amendments are going to affect asylum seekers? I think they're going to affect asylum seekers in a couple of ways. One, they do nothing to address the root causes, right? Whether it's the economic and political turmoil in Venezuela or the conflict in Ukraine, there is nothing in this agreement that makes the world safer in terms of why people are choosing to leave homes and homelands that they love in the first place. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. The other thing that I think is really important to draw attention to is that the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, which Canada and the United States are both signatories to, says that you cannot stigmatize or discriminate against people based on how they choose to make their refugee claim. We have, as human beings, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right to seek asylum. And so what we're seeing here is a conflict, right, in terms of rights. This is a, the fascinating thing about human rights and refugee rights is that they and them themselves are not the answer. We have to figure out how to 
uh, respond, address, ensure that rights are, are protected. And so one of the things that I think uh, advocates are really concerned about is what the safe third safe third country agreement and the additional protocol do to that fundamental question of refugee rights and the right to seek asylum. Well, Chris, I know, uh, I'd actually be interested in your perspective from the other side of the border on how we're doing here, because some people argue that Canada doesn't have adequate housing, adequate health care, adequate resources in our judicial system uh, to process irregular migration as it crosses the border. What do you what do you want to share on that? Well, you know, it's easy to point fingers. I, I think um, one of the things that we're dealing with is just inadequate staffing at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. We were all talking around Christmas time about the incredible backlog in visa applications, people who are looking to get through. I think the number in December was 2.1 million. Uh, that has a big impact. We, I was just at International Studies Association of Montreal. I knew a number of faculty who weren't American who were coming up to Montreal and they had to get a visa and the backlog was a serious problem. So. Overall, we don't have enough people. The second thing I would say, though, is that the United States and Canada are signatories to something called the Global Compact on Migration that tries to, as Laura was saying, eliminate the difference and distinction between economic migrants and refugees. Because our heart goes out to refugees, but economic migrants we've often seen as you know entrepreneurial, but maybe they could wait in line. Now, we've agreed to that, and in some ways, safe third country is a throwback, not to the 1951 agreement that the UN had, but to the 1967 update on refugees, and that says people should go apply for where they'd like to be from the first safe country they get to, the first safe third country, because it's not the country of their origin, it's not the country of destination. That put refugees into the responsibility of frontline states, and the frontline states expected ref money, other support from the rest of the world. So think about the Palestinian refugee camps that we had in Lebanon or Jordan. The rest of the world had to step up. In the global compact, safe third should be put to one side and we should welcome people into our country without those protocols. Uh, but neither the United States or Canada are ready for this vision, um, although I think it's ultimately the destination we need to get to. Aaron, can I get your take on that as well, whether we're adequately resourced to handle this on this side of the border? Yeah, look, I think there's always going to be a debate over um, how many, you know, refugees we should take. But I think we can all agree that however many we decide to take, we should we should process them in a, in a timely manner. And if we are not resourcing our you know, departments properly to do that, that's a that's a serious problem. You know, I, I also think, too, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Matakoro brought this up. Uh, there is a tension here between what the U.N. declaration says um, in terms of, uh, you know, the right for refugees to 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 apply. Um, is that light un unlimited? Does it what does it mean in terms of, do you, you know, are they all obligated to follow a certain procedure. I think we all recognize that, you know, people who are fleeing for their lives, um, we shouldn't turn a blind eye to it. But that comes into co conflict with the fact that people say, well, you know, one thing about a country is um, that defines a country is you have a border and that you have to have some control over who comes in and what the process is. So, you know, how do we how do we reconcile those two rights in a way that uh, that most of the public is going to support? Well, Laura, let's really bring this issue home, because, of course, one of the reasons we want to talk about this is, um, well, the tragic discovery that was found over the weekend, uh, eight migrants who died trying to leave Canada to get into the United States. Uh, really horrendous, but as we've talked about here, uh, people are prepared to take enormous risks if, if the hope of a better life is, um, is out there for them. Um, I, I just wonder whether you think the changes that have been made are going to encourage even riskier behavior in order to seek asylum or what? Yeah, I think that is the concern that the, the the changes make things more unsafe. I think one thing we're not talking enough about is the kind of messaging that people are receiving from people who potentially are exploiting uh, their desperate circumstances, promising safe passage to countries that they shouldn't actually be promising safe passage to, right? We see this on the U.S.-Mexico border uh, in quite in quite stark circumstances. And so the tragedy at Aquasasi is, is just that. It's a tragedy. And and it's really important to listen to what the community is saying. So the chief of police from Akwesasne is saying this is not the first uh, experience or encounter that they've had with people crossing uh, through Akwesasne territory. Of course, it's a very complicated uh, situation politically, given that the communities in Akwesasne, their territory is bisected by the Canada-U.S. border, the same way that uh, we see uh, the Tohono O'odham lands bisected on the Canada-Mexico border, right? So one 
thing we're not doing is asking Indigenous peoples, for instance, how they think we should be managing the border. I've seen lots from the chief of police at Akwesasne, but I'd be very um, curious to hear what uh, the community, the band council, would, would like to say on this. No, fair point. And, and uh, Chris, maybe I can get you to follow up in as much as... I'm going to assume that no official on either side of the border wants to put migrants in worse jeopardy than they're already in. But the question is whether or not the changes that have just been agreed to, in fact, do that or not. What's your view? My view is that it sends a clear signal that you, you can be processed in the normal way. And if you try to go through in an irregular crossing, you will be returned in a regular way to the normal procedure. So what I'm hoping is that people understand that one, however they choose to cross, as, as Laura was saying, we do have to respect their right to seek asylum, they will be taken into a kind of custody and then processed in the normal way. This is something that's been a huge issue for the United States since many of the human traffickers have started bringing unaccompanied minors. Some of them are actually related to them, and in some cases they're not. And when you bring in young kids and they don't have papers, it's an extra burden of care to make sure that they're taken care of. And I think in that 15,000 we've been hoping that Canada will take, we're hoping they'll take some of these uh, unaccompanied minors as well to help sort out the situation, get them into a safe home, and if necessary, return them to their parents. Aaron, have you got a view on this, given the tragic developments that took part this weekend? Well, look, I don't think anybody cannot be saddened by these sorts of stories. I mean, they're absolutely heartbreaking. But if you view the alternative as well, we can't, for example, we can't close Roxham Road because these sorts of situations will happen. I mean, it's essentially sending a signal to the public that we have to be held hostage by the possibility of these situations. I'm hoping that these are very rare occurrences. And in particular, the reason they happen now is that you had people who were planning to come to Roxham Road, planning to take the easy way, and they were essentially already there and figured, well, I'm already here. So I'm hoping that now that the border is closed, there were people who haven't really started their journey who will recognize the perilous nature of it and you know will have a deterrent effect no of course but uh, laura one wonders whether or not one wonders whether the changes that have been imposed now uh, will make desperate people even more vulnerable to human traffickers because people you know people are just prepared to take enormous risks when their lives are in danger to leave those circumstances what do you think yeah, I think we've seen, I mean, we we benefit in some ways from, from what has happened in the United States and seeing some of their efforts, you know, in terms of constructing the wall. And you, the idea of building a wall along the border suggests that no one's going to be able to cross it. But we know that people are now climbing over it or under it, right? The, the, the core issue here is that people are in such difficult circumstances, are, are hopeful, uh, seeking better homes, seeking better futures. And we've done nothing with this agreement, which is being challenged, I should emphasize, emphasize uh, in court, the Supreme Court has heard a challenge to the Safe Third Country Agreement. Depending on what they rule, this could change so much, right? Uh, but nothing in this agreement or in the additional protocol makes situations where people are coming from any safer. And I really think we need to have a conversation about that, especially given the, you know, the very prosperous, uh, we don't necessarily feel prosperous all the time, but Canada and the United States are global North countries. Hmm. Yeah, Chris, maybe you could help us understand whether this really gets the word out. And we're talking about two governments that have made an agreement mm -hmm. in English. We're dealing with people who, uh, many of whom obviously don't understand English, who are desperate uh, to get out of the circumstances they're in. When governments do this, does the word actually get out and have an impact? Hmm. I I think not. I think that what happens is that we change from trying to hunt people down when they're crossing the border in a regular space to sending the message that they'll be detained, but they don't have to run away from the officers. That we're, Whether it's a Border Patrol in the US, the RCMP in Canada, um, we want them to feel that that's the start of their going through a process, not the beginning of them being put into even greater peril or into a refugee camp or into some sort of detention. That's the kind of thing that, that really scares people and then they try to go underground and I think that makes them more vulnerable. One thing to add to this, which I think is a big concern for both of our countries, has been the collapse of civil order in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And we've seen Haitians who make their way to Trinidad, from Trinidad to Venezuela to Colombia, and then move through the Darien Gap, which is thick jungle through Panama, through Costa Rica, in order to keep going until they get to the Texas border. Now, 
That mm -hmm. isn't Roxham Road, but that's what people are willing to do just to get a chance to get to that Texas border. Mm -hmm. And that's way beyond our jurisdiction. So what we have to do is make sure that our officers know this is this is about helping people to be safe and that we hope our migrants will see that, get the word out that you don't have to be afraid of the Americans, you don't have to be afraid of the Canadians. Once you're there, you will be treated with human rights. Laura, can I get you on that as well? Does this actually get the word out to the people who need to know it? Uh, I don't I don't think it does. I think it it suggests a change in terms of the parameters, uh, the ways in which people can access refuge. Um, the thing about crossing at the at the border is people can still do that. Uh, regardless of their crossing at an unofficial uh, or official crossing, and they still have a, a, the right to make their claims heard. So we know that even since the agreement, the additional protocol was put into place last week, uh, people have presented, have been found at Roxham Road, have made their case, and have been allowed to stay in Canada to make their refugee claims. So we still have these very, very complicated processes. And maybe to speak a bit to what Chris and Aaron were saying, you know, where are we directing our resources? If we better serve, uh, you know, our immigration and refugee determination processes with proper funding and resources, perhaps then we, we move, we have a better system uh, in terms of processing people's claims. And this is what strikes me, you know, looking historically, there's been so much innovation in the Canadian context in terms of uh, the refugee sponsorship program, designated classes, civil service, have historically in this country uh, made great, great initiatives in terms of being more humanitarian. And so we know the government is capable of uh, important and innovative thinking in this regard. It's a question of what message are they trying to send. And in this instance, I don't think it's about um, we're trying to make, I know the messaging is we're making this safer for everyone, but I think what this agreement does and the protocol does is make it more complicated. And as Chris points out, people are going to go underground. It just creates this level of vulnerability uh, that I don't think addresses the core issues. Aaron, have you got a view on that? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, the, the message will not get out. And, it, and for those who do hear it, remember, they're going up against duplicitous characters like human traffickers that have every reason to lie to these people and give them false hope. So I, I'm under no illusion that this is not going to solve the problem. And, you know, we're not going to have any folks crossing irregularly, illegally into this country. Um, the question is whether it, it serves a deterrent effect, whether the numbers are lower. That, I think, is the real debate. And I think the, the sort of public uh, demand, broadly speaking, is, well, you know, are, are, do we have borders or do we not? Because we seem to have these spots where people just sort of walk across and they don't need to follow the rules that we've established. And I also think that's the reason why uh, it was good that part of this deal was to accept 15,000 refugees from Haiti um, through proper channels. I think it was a signal that, you know what, we are, we are willing to take people, but we want to do it on our terms and we want to make sure that they're following an agreed process. Chris. I, I think that's really the message we're trying to send. And the audience is ultimately Canadians and Americans. Now, from the U.S. side, we have a, a lot of people have a negative view of the way we're managing our border. There's also a lot of negativity about immigration because we worry about individuals who then become a public charge. They're using welfare. They're trying to get their feet uh, on their feet. And what has really made that issue under Trump and now Biden so explosive politically is the idea that the government isn't even in control. And I think the message of this agreement for Canadians is the governments are trying to get a handle on this and we're not going to allow people to put themselves at risk, but we're also not going to allow this situation to spin wildly out of control. And when I come back to that 117 million number, I think both our publics need to be reassured that the governments are going to do their level best to take care of people, but also make sure that that doesn't become a tidal wave. And there's so many issues involved. What I hope comes out of this is that Canadians and Americans gain some confidence that their governments are, are doing a good job or at least doing their best. Let me do a follow-up with you, Chris. And, I, uh, you know, a lot of people are asking whether or not the United States is, in fact, a safe country for refugees these days. What do you think? Well, and rem you remember, it was a, a little more than a year ago, the Supreme Court raised this question. Canada and the U.S. have a safe third country agreement, but... At the end of the day, the Supreme Court didn't say Canada that the U.S. is not safe. It's just that Canada had no process for even determining that. And I think under Donald Trump, the case wasn't all that great. So now where we are, I think what the court has asked is that we have a real process and that determination is made. I think the U.S. is still a safe country um, for refugees, that we still are inclined to take people. But I think at this present time, um, it's important that we shore up confidence among Canadians and Americans that we're prepared to take care of people and, and kind of counter the rhetoric, which has been so anti-migrant, and especially in the United States, so anti-refugee, which has really, I think, been an, uh, shown an ugly side of the 
of the debate in the U.S., which we haven't thankfully got too much in Canada yet. Hmm. Aaron, your take on that? Yeah, you know, to the point at the end that uh, uh, Dr. Sands is talking about, I, I really think that, um, you know, my view on this is I do not want to see a situation like we are seeing in the United Kingdom, like we've seen in the United States in terms of backlash. I think government demonstrating that it is in control of things is absolutely imperative to keeping public confidence and not getting a very nasty political backlash. So, you know, I, uh, I know that there are people who have concerns about the impact on individual refugees, but my bigger concern is a larger, broader, nasty political backlash. And if governments can't show that they have control of borders, I think that there's a serious risk of that. Laura, what do you say on that? I think I would say that, you know, in terms of messaging and this idea that what the Canadian government do is doing is, is suggesting that it's in control and in charge of things is a tricky one because it does stigmatize people who are moving. And uh, there's a fabulous book by Rebecca Hamlin called Crossings, which I'm just going to recommend to everyone. But essentially, they argue that, you know, the way that people move is so complicated now. So this idea that you can understand where someone has come from in their history based on what label you, you give to them. So whether you call them a migrant, a refugee, whether you use the term irregular, or illegal, it actually tells you very little about their very complicated stories. And so I think that my concern, and I appreciate very much the points that, that Chris and Aaron are making in terms of we haven't seen the same level of backlash as in other countries, that doesn't mean that we aren't seeing quite a bit of resistance. And we need to be very careful to make sure that anything we do uh, is doesn't stigmatize people for the way that they move. And I worry, in part, my concern about this, this latest change is because we know that this government has politicized the refugee issue previously. If you think back, uh, six years to when Roxham Road, you know, when Trump was in power, um, we had a, a significant number of refugees crossing at Roxham Road, and the Prime Minister treated, tweeted, welcome refugees. It was a completely different message, right? Same border, same kinds of migrants, but very different political context. And so the ease with which these issues get politicized, I think, is very dangerous because it does lead, lead to stigmatization sorry, stigmatization, uh, and it does make it more complicated to understand what are the legal parameters, what are people's histories and reasons for moving, and so we need to be really attentive to that. Aaron, I'm down to my last minute here, and since you are in the nation's capital, uh, not too far away from where the Supreme Court of Canada is actually considering whether or not the safe third country agreement is in fact constitutional, if the Supreme Court strikes down the agreement just made, then what? So first of all, we'd be surprised to see that outcome. Um, if that did happen, of course, um, all bets are off. Um, we have to back to the drawing board, and I think it calls into question a lot of uh, not just not just this particular safe third country agreement, but other um, um, you know federal legislation. Excuse me, that may come into contract contact with um, uh, UN uh, UN law. Chris, last twenty seconds to you on that. What happens if? Well, some of some of your viewers will remember that one of the Supreme Court of Canada's first big decisions after the repatriation of the Constitution eighty two was the Singh ruling, in which they said that people who come to Canada have the rights of a Canadian, including access to health care, education, and public defenders as soon as they get here. And that ruling, I think, was well-intentioned, but so broad, it made it harder to control migration here. I think the Supreme Court of Canada, like many Supreme Court judges in the United States, are looking for an, an opportunity to narrow that decision, to be a bit more practical and help the government to do what it's out to do. So I'm, I'm optimistic that the Supreme Court this time around will give better guidance, uh, not strike down the agreement, but maybe give us some parameters so that we can operate with it fairly, or you can operate with it fairly. Mm -hmm. And on the American side, well, you know, it, we'll just see what we can do. Uh, we're a bit of a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that an American guest on a Canadian program can quote a Canadian court decision from 40 years ago with such authority. That's great. <laughs> Uh, Christopher Sands here in our studio from the Wilson Center. Aaron Woodruff in the nation's capital from the McDonald Laurier Institute. Laura Matacoro from Carleton University, also in Ottawa. Thanks so much to the three of you for being with us on TVO tonight. It's been a pleasure. was once perhaps the most influential lobbyist in the country. Prime ministers, premiers, and more than a thousand chief executives listened attentively to his advice. In fact, at one point, someone referred to him as the, quote, de facto prime minister of the country. And it wasn't meant as a compliment. Thomas D'Aquino chronicles his time trying to influence public policy in Canada in his new memoir. It's called Private Power, 
public purpose, adventures in business, politics, and the arts, and it brings the former head of the Business Council on National Issues to our studio tonight, and it's great to have you in that chair. Welcome. Steve, pleasure to be here. I want to start with your name, because your father always told you, honor your name. Right. You're obviously named after St. Thomas Aquinas. Right. What's the story there? Well, the story is that uh, the family name goes back, obviously, a long, long time. And uh, I happen to be named Thomas. Uh, and as you know, it carries the weight of history uh, in the sense that more often in Europe uh, than in North America, when I'm introduced as Thomas de Quino, people say, yes, I mean, can it really be your name? <laughs> so, but my father always used to say, a name means something. And uh, since this particular name has historical importance, I expect you to honor the name. Yeah, that's, you know, where it came from. Gotcha. You, I guess, started your political affiliation in Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's office. Right. Long, long time ago. What'd you do for him? Well, I was a, uh, I was a junior member of the staff, but I wrote speeches. I worked on organizational memos. I did briefing notes. It was sort of a, a general ragbag of responsibilities that I had. And it was great fun. It was a wonderful time to be in government. Did you like him? I did. I, like is perhaps not so much the word, uh, the, the word that I would use, uh, Steve, but I would say I hugely admired him because I was not one of these young liberals with shiny uh, liberal credentials. When I went to work uh, for him, uh, I saw him as the philosopher king. And because he was greatly interested in the Constitution and some of these esoteric issues that I was interested in, it was more of a, 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 an academic admiration than perhaps a political admiration. Well, this is why I asked the question, because, of course, you gained your reputation as being a guy deeply and tr you know, interested and focused on economic issues. Right. And he was not. I mean, Clear. he was very focused on Philosopher King issues, justice, constitution, and so on. Did that take some of the shine off him for you? It certainly did by the end of the, the time that I worked with him, be, when it became very clear to me that the economy was not a top priority for him. And when in the latter part of that, the first time he uh, lost and Joe Clark, as you know, became uh, prime minister, in that particular moment, there was considerable economic dissatisfaction in the country. And I think that that was a reflection of the fact that he himself did not consider it a priority. Constitutional issues, even China, extending mm. diplomatic relations with China mm. in that early period was one of the official languages. These were bringing French Canada to the center of the nation. These were very, very important uh, achievements on the part of Pierre Trudeau. Joe Clark, we should add, your former university roommate. <laughs> right. <laughs> right on. Okay. 1977, there's a lobby group in the country called the Business Council on National Issues, and they asked you for your opinion of them, and you told them you thought they were very unimpressive. How did they react to that? Not well. Uh, I sent. I was an advisor to the to the nascent business council, and I rather cheekily uh, sent a note saying that the sleeping leviathan should wake up. And I was summoned to the Mount Royal Club in Montreal uh, by the then titans of business, the heads of CPR, Ian Sinclair, Paul Demaray Sr., really quite a collection. Earl McLaughlin of the Royal Bank. And, um, and when I said, look, times are changing, the old boys club in the future is not going to work. And I remember Ian Sinclair looking at me and saying, what are you talking about, Tom? He said, when I want to speak to Pierre, I just pick up the phone and call him and Earl can do this with the prime minister or with the governor of the Bank of Canada. What's all this nonsense? I stood my ground. Uh, and when I walked out of the room, I thought I'd have been fired as an advisor. Shortly thereafter, they invited me to lunch again, and they offered me the job. There you uh, go. So there you are. Uh, convinced that I was fired, but in fact, I was hired. A lot of business executives were, and still are, afraid to speak out on the big issues of the day because right. they fear angering politicians or losing market share or whatever. Should they have that fear? No, they should certainly not. And uh, Steve, when I took on the role of the Business Council, uh, it's not that these individuals who were very, very forceful people, um, it's not that they were afraid of government. They either tended to ignore government or would get angry if governments didn't do what they wanted. But there was no such thing. And I can speak to this because when I was in the prime minister's office, I saw what was a dearth of consultation. There was no such thing as business leaders reaching out uh, 
even in areas such as taxation and uh, trade, let alone getting into areas that were farther uh, afield. So my maiden speech, I argued, number one, you have to be engaged. Uh, number two, we have to be we have to do serious work on public policy issues to be taken seriously. Number three, we can't just focus on the predictable. Uh, and that's when they began to accept the idea that we would go to areas such as the environment. For example, defense policy, which had not been looked at by business since the, the war, but, but also very important that um, we be nonpartisan. Uh, absolutely crucial. And if you said to me at that particular time, were the majority of the 100 plus CEOs more liberal than conservative? I would say probably yes. I would say that most of them probably voted liberal. That's because that, the Liberal Party had a business wing in it back then. Exactly, exactly. You know, on the, the carry on from C.D. Howe, mm -hmm. the symbiotic relationship between business and government in that respect. But the idea that they should uh, not only be nonpartisan, but take a very active role was very new. But there was one other really important thing Steve, and that is the uh, the principle of shareholder value. Uh, the the steps that we took at that time, I would argue, I do argue in the book, were revolutionary, because the assumption was that Milton Friedman's principles that it's all about shareholder value, and if any CEO is caught dabbling in anything else, you're not doing your job, and you should be fired. So this idea that we should go towards stakeholder capitalism was, I would argue, a very seminal departure at that particular period. I, and today, of course, it's taken for granted. I was going to say, history has proven you were writer than Mr. Friedman well, on that one. Uh, at least so far. So far, okay. <laughs> I want to ask you about one of the more memorable moments uh, on Parliament Hill where you got yourself into a little bit of trouble, and this was, uh, you've talked about this in the book, and it's a good story. Brian Mulroney's the Prime Minister. He's cornered on Parliament Hill by a senior citizen who's told him that he's gone back on his word because Mr. Mulroney always pledged he would never de-index seniors' pensions, right. right? He'd always keep that inflation protection in there. And a little old lady cornered him on the hill and said, you know, you went back on this, and next time for you, it's going to be goodbye, Charlie Brown. Right. And you got asked, apparently, whether you supported the de-indexing of seniors' pensions, and you said, no, you didn't. Michael Wilson, the then finance minister, called you up and accused you of effing up the government's plans, although right. I'm not sure he said effing. Uh, Bill Fox, who was a Mulroney advisor, said he wanted to rip your heart out for saying what you said. Were you disloyal to the Conservative government on that occasion? That's the question. Well, it, to me, it was never a question of disloyalty mm. because I never saw, you know, on this, coming back to this issue of nonpartisanship, mm. uh, that to me was an absolutely baked in principle. And that is that every, everything we stood for had to be what we believed. But and they thought you were one of them. Some of them thought that yeah. we were one of them. And in fact, uh, Brian Mulroney in his memoir said when, you know, they decided to pull back from the, the major measures in that budget, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, even the reliable <laughs> BCNI could not be counted on. Yeah. So, uh, and incidentally, Michael Wilson, who uh, I, uh, was a great, we developed a great friendship over time. And my wife, Susan, worked with him for many years. Um, yes, he did use the effing word. He was, I've never seen him uh, so angry because it was Mulroney's first budget, Wilson's first budget, and the stand down was, in their mind, acutely embarrassing. But we had said clearly over and over again, mm -hmm. we will support uh, moves to cut the deficit, but it should not be done on the backs of, uh, of the poor or mm -hmm. uh, people who simply could not afford to take the hit. And we recommended a way of doing it they didn't follow our advice, and there we are. So my telephone calls, I didn't get any telephone calls. I was frozen out <laughs> for a good six to eight months. You were, on the other hand, a big booster of Brian Mulroney's free trade agreement with the United States, right. and you were very unhappy with the then liberal leader John Turner's uh, very fierce opposition right. to that agreement. And you said in the book that your relationship with Turner, which before that had been pretty good, basically hit rock bottom at that point. Did you two ever have a rapprochement? Actually, we did. It was a it, it was a surprising moment. We were attending uh, the funeral of a man called John Grace, who was a very close friend of John Turner. Oh, from way back in Ottawa. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, while we were at the uh, post-funeral reception, um, 
Of all people, Alan McKechn, who I did not know that well. Another liberal cabinet that's minister. That's right. Came up to me and he said, come on over and say hello to John. And I was, I was on the other side of the room. And when I went over to see him, uh, he reached out his hand and so did I. And he said, let's, Tom, let's put, by God's, let's put, let, you know, let's put this behind us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always thought that John Turner was a very classy guy. And, uh, and I thought that that was a very generous thing for him to do. There were some people in the country at this time who thought you had way too much influence right. with way too many prime ministers. Right. Did you? Did it feel that way to you? Well, I, uh, Steve, I felt that at least, you know, my, my letters have responded and we, we had pretty good two-way conversations, uh, some more with some than, than others. Uh, but I also had to pay a price for that because I was demonized by the left. Um, I was burned in effigy in front of the Chateau Laurier. Uh, cow dung was dumped on my driveway. Uh, death th the rats came by the dozens. Uh, mm -hmm. I never had any security. But only to say that, as I say in the book, you know, the pursuit, the principal pursuit of uh, good public policy um, in the face of everything uh, often does carry a price, but that's all right if you believe in what you're doing. Do you, I, I well remember when somebody called you the de facto prime minister of the country. I did not like that. You didn't like no, it? No, I did not like that at all. And uh, when Peter Newman, in, in, in his writings, you know, referred to me as the greatest single power in policy formation in history, which of course was total nonsense, hmm. those kind of things, uh, I, if there were things that kept me awake at night, it's, it's when people referred to me as the de facto prime minister. I considered every time that anything like that was said, it was a failure rather than an achievement. <laughs> you often tried to get governments to cut taxes. And here is an excerpt from your book on that. Sheldon, if you would, bring this graphic up. Finance Minister Paul Martin heard me say that a $100 billion tax cut would massively boost Canadian competitiveness. This led to a late evening telephone call from the minister. He was fuming. Tom, he said... What have you been smoking? Where am I going to find $100 billion? <laughs> okay, I want to ask you about that because federal and provincial governments over the course of the last couple of decades would end up cutting corporate taxes significantly. And one of the things that you know, we were told would happen if they did that was that there would be this great investment in hiring people, new jobs, retooling plants, uh, reinvesting the money in themselves and so on. And I well remember Jim Flaherty, the former conservative finance minister, saying they didn't do any of that. In fact, they sat on all that dead money and paid themselves bigger dividends, and he was not happy about that. Right. Did business act selfishly on those occasions? A complex question, but it requires a very direct answer. Uh, the answer is that business didn't do enough uh, of that. But it's not because the CEOs with whom I worked were shy about wanting to invest in Canada. I mean, by this time, major Canadian companies had begun to develop. Unlike when I took over the council where multinationals were dominant. Uh, so every red-blooded Canadian who runs a major company wants to employ people and grow the company in Canada. Uh, we didn't always have the best circumstances to do that. The idea of sitting on dead money is anathema to most of the CEOs that I've worked with, because if you do that, you're not doing your job and your shareholders are not going to be very happy. And what the financial press writes about you is not going to be very complimentary. So I would say that the impediments to investment or the long record of slow growth that we've had in Canada is due to a number of factors. Uh, you might say, well, were the CEOs entrepreneurial enough. I would argue that a, quite a few of them were. Uh, did they face impediments or did they have to deal with an environment in the United States that was vastly more attractive? Hence my argument, in addition to free trade, cutting the GST, all magnificent policy achievements, we also had to go the next step with tax cuts. And to the great benefit of the, certainly the Martin Kretjian government, uh, those tax cuts, in fact, were implemented. So when the minister asked me, <laughs> what have you been smoking, Tom? <laughs> we knew that not $100 billion in one year, $100 billion over a decade was eminently doable. And, they, and to their great credit, they did it. And it made a difference in Canada. But having said that, do you think you empowered some of your political adversaries 
who would have looked at you and said, there he goes again, he's only advocating for big fat business and he's not doing anything for the country. Well, uh, my counter argument to that uh, is that, um, and, and I, I know it's very difficult, Steve, to make the argument that you're, all of our public policy moves were aimed at achieving a better country. But this goes right to the very philosophy of what I stood for way back then and still do now. The role of capital is not the enhancement of capital. The role of capital is to achieve a better society. Because this idea, coming back to Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. if it's only about enriching a limited number of shareholders, which is a fraction of the total population, you're clearly not doing your job. And if I look at the amount of taxes that the large companies have, have paid, if I look at what is stakeholder capitalism now, and that is what over the last 10, 15, and 20 years companies have been doing to become better corporate citizens, far from a perfect record, but I would say not one where the left or anyone could say, you know, you people are only interested in one thing, and that is profit. I, I would argue very strongly against that. And that book is full of examples, uh, in my view, of where we tried to do things that would make for a better country, even if it meant uh, having less in profit, even if it meant that our immediate shareholders might not always be happy with what we were doing. One example, sir. Well, one example would be uh, looking at the oil industry. The oil industry, which is vilified, uh, the oil industry, I would argue, has been not only a huge provider of taxes, the largest single provider of taxes to the national purse, and you say to yourself, well, where do those taxes go? They go to schools, they go to health care, they go to education, they go to all these benefits. What are these taxes used for? It's not that we are grossly undertaxed in Canada, uh, but those are major sources of revenue that help build a better society. We would not be doing these things if people were not paying what I would call their fair share of taxes. Back in 2014, the then called University of Western Ontario, now Western University in London, gave you an honorary degree. Yes. And you gave some advice to some of the kids who were there. Shall we play some of that? Sheldon, the clip, if you would. My experience in Mr. Trudeau's office showed me several things about leadership. That it is lonely at the top, that the physical demands of high office can be excruciating, that the buck really does stop on the leader's desk, and that a leader's hold on power can be extraordinarily ephemeral. I want to just uh, have that kickstart a bit of a conversation with you about who the best and worst politicians you enjoy dealing with, or maybe not so much over the years, were. Who's the most effective, best prime minister you dealt with in your time? I would say that, uh, as you know, you've read the book and you see that I've laid on some pretty heavy compliments on virtually all of the prime ministers who had strengths. I would say the prime minister who had the most accomplished record, mm. as in the introduction of major policy decisions that really mattered, would be Brian Mulroney. For business or for the country as a whole? For the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would put Jean Chrétien as a close second. And why do I say that? I say that because the holy grail of good public policy I think was best exemplified in the moves of Brian Mulroney on free trade, GST. Don't the Americans wish they could have done their equivalent of a GST? And Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin for having turned around Canada's abysmal fiscal situation in the early 90s and the come hell or high water budget of Mr. Martin took Canada, which had the worst record in the G7, and turned it into the best record. And that combination of free trade, tax reform, and fiscal responsibility put Canada on a path of repeated uh, surpluses right up until, in, well into Harper, and right up until the great financial crisis of 2008. Who was the most frustrating prime minister to deal with? The most frustrating? Um, well, you know, Steve, I, it, it's hard for me to say that because I don't think I was terribly frustrated by any prime minister. I found that Jean Chrétien was a man who marched to his own drum uh, and, and did it, I think, with... Uh, <laughs> I always admired him, you know, the little guy from Shawinigan. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, I don't think frustration in the sense that I would say perhaps Stephen Harper, if one used the word frustration in the sense that was there a warmer relationship? No, there was not. But I did say publicly that the relationship with Harper was exactly what I think the relationship between the business um, leaders of the country and the government should be. It should be correct. It should be strictly nonpartisan. It should be at arm's length. It should not be too chummy. Uh, our relationship with Mulroney, and even to some extent with Craigtown, was more chummy than it was with Harper. But I did not lament the Harper relationship because I think that's the ideal relationship is a correct arm's length relationship so that nothing is expected of you and you do not expect anything of them other than what can come out of legitimate two-way discussions on what is good policy and what isn't. Dozens of premiers you would have dealt with during your time. Who yeah. was the best one to deal with? Oh, I would say Peter Lougheed would be there and John Craig... Uh, and Josh Array. I would say my two favorite premiers in that 30, 40 year period probably would be uh, Lougheed and, and Charest. And the worst? Um, and the worst. <laughs> uh, I, well, there, there, uh, There's so many you can't figure well, out which well, one should there, take there, the crown. No, crowd. I mean, but you know, there, <laughs> isn't it amazing because my mind automatically goes to the good. Roy Romano, NDP. Is someone I hugely admired mm. because he was a very progressive, uh, central-leaning New Democratic Party leader. I would rate him certainly in my top three or four. Um, uh, Gordon Campbell. Gordon Campbell, to me, from British Columbia, mm. is a man who could have been an effective prime minister. So I tend to look at those. The others maybe don't, uh, you know, maybe they're not so much front of mind because they don't, they don't rank up there the way these three or four or five premiers did. With all of the political people you've hung around with in your life, did you ever think about running yourself? <laughs> I did briefly, uh, Steve, when I, uh, when I um, was working in Prime Minister Trudeau's office. Uh, I toyed around with the idea, wouldn't it be nice to run in my the constituency where I grew up, although it had always voted NDP or most of the time, uh, in the southeastern corner of British Columbia, or maybe even on the West Island of Montreal, where I'd spent some time. Um, but having looked after, having seen politics up close from that apex of power that I was privileged to work in, Mr. Trudeau's office, uh, I saw how brutal it was, how demanding it was. And I came to the conclusion then that I probably wouldn't practice black letter law, I wouldn't go off and be a full-time professor of law, although I did do some teaching, but I wanted to have an impact on the public policy environment, and the best way to do it would be as, as, as an entrepreneur. Go out, create my own company, and do it. And that's what I did uh, just after I came back from a period of time in London and Paris and set up my own, uh, my, my own multidisciplinary consulting firm. And I'm not sorry that I went down that road. When I look back on it now, Am I glad that I didn't go into politics? Yes. Am I glad that I'm not a full-time law professor? Yes. <laughs> Am I glad that I did what I did? I have no regrets, except for, as I said, the cow dung on the, <laughs> on, on the, on the driveway. <laughs> okay, I've known you a long time, so I'm going to presume upon our relationship to ask you a bit of a personal question here, which is, do you think you were able to achieve all of what you did achieve in your professional life because you didn't have kids, and therefore, that was not the distraction that it is for so many of the rest of us. Yeah, Steve, very good question. Uh, my wife, Susan, and I love children. And in fact, we have 12 godchildren. A number of them, um, I think you may have even heard one of them. At, I did, at your book at, launch. At, at the book yeah, launch. She was great. So uh, the reality, though, is that Susan's career, uh, which in many respects mirrored mine, uh, Quite literally, she went to work for the Briefing Council office when I started at the council, and she stepped down as an associate deputy minister when I left the council. So we were very driven in what we were doing, got a huge satisfaction out of it. We never had debates about would it, you know, if, if we were fortunate enough to have children, would we say, oh, 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 my, oh, me? No, you know, we we're always open to the idea. But the fact of the matter is that. Uh, a family life would not perhaps have enabled us to do what we did. Having said that, there are all sorts of people with multiple children who have done huge things in life. So I'm not saying that you have to have one in order to not have the other. Gotcha.
I can scarcely believe this. You're 82 now? Do I admit that on air? <laughs> I, uh, uh, whether you admit it or not, it's a fact. <laughs> uh, you look great. You're full of, still full of beans, if I can put it that way. What mission animates your life now? Well, it's a mixture. Uh, part of it is philanthropy. Uh, for the last 25 years, uh, working with the National Gallery of Canada and raising money, getting attract uh, attracting works of art, working with uh, philanthropists in the arts domain, both at the National Arts Centre, where I work closely with people like Peter, the great hero P Peter Herendorf, mm -hmm. who we lost recently. Uh, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is public policy, closely associated with the Ivy Business School, uh, deeply involved in North American public policy issues, uh, uh, doing some lecturing, teaching, having sat on some boards. I've pulled back from my boards now. So it's been a very rich life. Did some work for the Vatican uh, in, in, you know, after I left the council. Um, worked with the Canada-Australia Business Council. So, you know, a lot of balls at once. But I always believe what my father used to tell me. He used to give a, a, an Italian translation of a, a general idea that, you know, a rolling stone picks up no moss. <laughs> and that is to be active to the very end. And that there's no such thing as retirement. And there has, I've never really retired. People say, well, you retired from the council. Well, no, I didn't. Uh, I work as many hours now as I did then. Nothing has really changed. So if God gives me good health, working at it, uh, not 24 hours a day, but trying my best, and I've been blessed in that regard. Auguri, Signor D'Aquino. Grazie molto. Molto bene. Let's <laughs> remind people this book is called Private Power, Public Purpose, Adventures in Business, Politics, and the Arts, and we're delighted that it's brought Thomas D'Aquino to our studio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Much appreciated. And that is the agenda for Monday, April 3rd, 2023. While many see the Ring of Fire as a once-in-a-generation opportunity, some of the First Nations from Ontario's north have a different view. And tomorrow, we'll hear from three of those First Nations. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.